This is the Jeff Santos Show. 33 minutes past the hour. It's the Jeff Santos Show that you are tuned into. We're here every Monday through Friday, 3 to 6 p.m. Eastern Time, 12 to 3 Pacific. And that's where we are going right now into the 206, where you hear the music of the Renaissance Man, the man we know as MTC. He's a musician, he's an investigative journalist, he's a columnist, he is a regular Tuesday contributor right here on the Jeff Santos Show. He is Mark Taylor Canfield, Tuesdays at 534 Eastern Time. Mark, how are you, sir? Mark Taylor Canfield, reporter for duty, sir. <laughs> I'm here in Seattle where it's sunny and don't tell anyone. And uh, thanks, Ron, for playing my song. You gave me a heads up that you're going to play that. It's Emerald City Blues. That's one of my bluesy piano songs. But uh, I wanted to mention that I also just wrote an article at Daily Coast. So yeah, we're, we'll I'm get to that in a second. Studio, my studio, surrounded by musical instruments, but I have a really long, bushy beard now, Jeff. It looks like Uh-oh. I haven't been getting out very much. <laughs> well, don't let it grow I'll down to your bit. knees, whatever you do. <laughs> It's starting to look a little bit like Robinson Crusoe, so I should probably trim it up a little. Yeah, yeah, I would do probably that. At that point, ask your girlfriend; she, she'll she'll be the one to give you oh, the best believe. advice. <laughs> but beards are very popular in Seattle. It's been popular for a long time oh, for yeah. guys to just kind of let it go here. So whether you don't shave for four or five days at a time, which is kind of the rough, you know, grungy look, which the girls like, or you know, if you just decide to grow it really long and do the hippie woodsman look oh, a lot of women really like that here Jeff so you know there's no panic for taste in Seattle it's, it's up to well, the individual yeah I, I agree with you there and I think it's great that they have a uh, very diverse taste uh, on on the other hand I don't like it because it gets too itchy after about four or five days and I can grow a beard in 30 seconds so the way I look at it <laughs> Let me ask you, Mr. Canfield, um, you know, we, we hear a lot about the great things of Seattle, and it's a fantastic city, and we really should be emulated in a lot of ways. It's great music scene, and what they've been fighting for with the showbox, uh, the fact that you've been able to get people to do the minimum wage that started all there, the $15 minimum wage piece that started in SeaTac and then Seattle City Council. You have a, a socialist uh, city councilor. It really has some great things. You get Mark Taylor Canfield. But I also know that you get two people there in Mr. Bezos and Mr. Gates, the world of Microsoft, the world of Amazon right now, front and center. Of course, he's, uh, Mr. Bezos uh, providing all these jobs at the same time not providing the health care, uh, although they've been pushed in the direction now recently to do just that. Then you have the scenario of Mr. Gates, who's no longer with Microsoft. He's now retired. I guess he's always a part of it, pushing for this vaccine. He's going to pay for it and so forth. And uh, but, you know, a lot of people that I talk to that are independent minded, I guess, you know, they're not necessarily so keen about being first in line uh, to have this vaccine. We don't know the side effects, don't know everything. And even though everybody wants to get COVID-19 behind them, it's not snap your fingers and everything, you know, turns to Shangri-La. So what is the, the perspective now of, of people in Washington State in the 206 primarily? is a whole different world out there in Spokane in the eastern part of the state. But um, of, of Gates, of Amazon, of Bezos, what, 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 is, what is the feeling, you know, as we have gone through this the last couple of months? Well, we are the city I call, you know, the Emerald City is our nickname. You know, Portland is the Rose City. We're the Emerald City. It's always green here. But there are some wizards behind the curtain, and you're, you're supposed to pay no, atten- no attention to the men behind the curtain who control <laughs> our local politics and bankrupt candidates for the city council and are always fighting our socialist uh, city council member, Shama Swan. In, in, in fact, we're in uh, Amazon tax round two. The first time that Shama Sawant was able to convince the city council to vote for a tax for housing programs in Seattle against large corporations and Amazon in particular, the city council went ahead and passed it, and then two weeks later rescinded their own vote. So now we're on round two, where Shama Sawant is once again approaching the city council with a package of corporate taxes against Amazon and anybody making over like $7 million annually in Seattle. And of course, there's a big pushback against it. And Jenny Erkin was quoted as saying, well, that will never happen here, you know, because she's kind of cynical and uh, un- sometimes, you know, been accused of part of that corporate Democrat crowd. The city council, by the way, just passed uh, a series of ordinances on Monday 
and I was invited to testify on that. Everybody is doing it online right now, but we do have an existing emergency moratorium on that prohibits rent-related evictions of residential tenants, nonprofits, and certain small businesses. But that was all set to end on June 4th when our statewide moratorium on residential evictions was also scheduled to run out. So council member uh, Lorena Gonzalez has a bill that would protect residential tenants for an additional six months by adding a special section in the city law that dictates the circumstances under which evictions can happen. So we don't have rent control in Seattle, Jeff, because the state legislature prohibits that statewide. But we do have some restrictions on evictions at the moment, and that just happened on Monday. And the Amazon tax, that's being pushed by Shama Sawan and Cami Morales, who's also a very progressive member of, of our city council. But in terms of the, the wizards, as I call them, it was Paul Allen, actually, at, at one point, too. He was another one of the founders of Microsoft and was a multi-multi-billionaire in Seattle who built the EMP, the Experience Music Project, which is now called the Museum of Pop Culture. He also owned the Seahawks uh, football team. Right. I had a chance to meet the guy, the interesting guy. He also owns Vulcan, though which is a major, major real estate development and construction corporation here in Seattle, which is just wiping out entire neighborhoods. I did wake up to some construction sounds today, Jeff, for the first time. Uh, Governor Inslee has drifted a few of those restrictions on uh, construction sites so that if the companies can prove that they're following certain safety guidelines, they're able to do some work. So I did hear some of that this morning, and I saw a couple crews out working yesterday. There's a few more essential businesses and other kind of food places and things that are opening up in Seattle. So it's slowly happening. But I happen to live in the middle of Amazon land and also not far from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the Paul Allen Brain Institute. Now, Paul Allen just passed away within the last year. Right. Um, but his, his estate is still a part of this big billionaire scene in, in Seattle. And we have some of the richest people in the world living here, which is always amazing to me. And maybe one of the signs of monopoly capitalism or something when you realize that we also have one of the biggest homeless populations in the country. So the dichotomy there is really startling. One of the things I noticed about the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Jeff, is that it's highly, highly secure. Like when you go by there, it looks like a military compound or something. I mean, there's like guard yeah. posts and it's really highly secure. When you go by the Paul Allen Brain Institute for research on brain diseases, it's actually pretty open to the public. So there's a big difference there. And I'm not sure whether that's because they're handing a lot of money or because there have been a lot of protests against the Gates Foundation in the past especially because of the Gates Foundation's support of certain kinds of genetically modified organisms as a way to stop starvation around the world and, and feed folks. So I live in the middle of all this, and so I'm sure I have a very unique perspective. It's, I, have, I deal with it every single day, this whole sort of billionaire class of people. And I would say that right now, Amazon has been criticized locally for many reasons, not paying taxes, you know, and also and fighting progressive uh, members of the city council when they run for election and re-election, but also, you know, some of the safety concerns that people have had. And obviously Amazon, as, as you mentioned in your text to me earlier today, is doing great financially, and it's actually moving the economy. This whole pandemic is moving the economy more towards uh, in a direction in, that it already had a mono, lot of momentum for be, before this happened. There was already this move towards online purchases, which unfortunately has put a lot of mom and pop shops out of business, a lot of small chains going out of business yeah, because Amazon has such a huge monopoly. And the fact that it's not just the fact that they would like to control a little bit of the market. They're starting to sound a little bit like Microsoft was sounding where they just want to own everything. And that's right. the problem with some of these major corporations or billionaires is their ego just never ends. I mean, they just, I guess, acquiring things becomes the only thing that's interesting to them anymore. So it's just one market after another, one product after another, one business after another until they start to sort of try to own everything. Now, with Microsoft, that backfired when they tried to own a cellular phone system. They lost billions of dollars on that. But right now, there are people who are talking about all of this, these same subjects that you just brought up here in Seattle, and it always comes down to this issue of we have these billionaires, they have a lot of push and a lot of clout in this town, and then there's a whole uh, culture in this town that really doesn't take our cue from rich people and doesn't take our cue from famous people or people who 
um, uh, have a lot of political power. And so there's this rebellious kind of nature. Where That's great. Well, time- we need that. Frankly, we need that in, in Washington, yeah. D.C. right now. And we talked with our contributors earlier, Robert Craig and, and Bob Kuzak and Wendell Potter, about all these issues, particularly on health care and, and the 2K a month thing that looks like it's not going to happen because Washington, D.C. is so out of touch, bought by those co- similar corporations and others. Um, I'm wondering if there is any sort of alliance. And, you know, I think that these are the things that progressives and others got to start forming because they, they in themselves are not big enough, tragically. Um, and, you know, whether it's it's forming uh, an alliance between Sawant and Jay Inslee or in the case of, of your mayor, Durkin, I believe her name is, because uh, th- these folks that particularly, you know, the mayor of Seattle and the governor of Washington state are pivotal. And if they can get closer to where a, a socialist uh, Democrat or a very progressive Democrat can can actually, you know, have an ally in that key office. Office, then all of a sudden you have something. Then maybe after Inslee leaves that somebody who is a Sawant disciple can run for that spot, or maybe Sawant herself can can be the next senator. I mean, you know, so I'm just thinking, you know, maybe she needs to be mayor first and then work your way up. But but I, I just wonder if there is a line of demarcation, you know, Democrats go here, progressives go there, socialists go there, or can they can they form an alliance? Jeff, and that's how Shama Sawant got elected the first time and then re-elected last year. Uh, That's how folks like uh, Robert Reich's protege, Andrew Lewis, got elected. There is a progressive coalition amongst, with well, with Shama Sawant, in particular, had to do with the Socialist Alternative Party, other Democratic Socialists and, and working people's parties, and also small businesses and progressive Democrats, some independents. And, you know, sort of a, it was sort of a diverse culture of a lot of people who I wouldn't necessarily say were all on the left, but at least had some interest in some kind of progressive issues like the $15 minimum wage, which is something that she really pushed and that has spread across the country. And so there's already sort of a coalition there, but there's also a split. And that comes with the uh, more traditional Democrats in the state who often do, you know, we've talked about this before, often run as so-called progressives and then get into office and start bending backwards to do the bidding of the major corporate people and Wall Street investors. And and we see that in Seattle, especially with the mayor's office. The idea that you brought up, actually, of uh, of a Shama Sawant as mayor of the city would be kind of revolutionary, I think, because that would be a pulpit for her to really spread some of these ideas that right now are actually becoming more prevalent around the country. At least people are talking about them more, like some kind of guaranteed income, minimum wage, right. rent controls, you know, affordable housing for, for folks, free education. Those are typical socialist kind of programs, and she would like to, to push those. But I think ever since she's been a city council member, there's been one major crisis or issue after another that, have, that had to be addressed. And she was able to get the $15 an hour minimum wage through, but when it came to the Amazon tax, it's still this huge battle that, that I think, you know, just from my point of view, and she would probably say she hasn't quite won, or the movement hasn't quite won. She's also another person who believes that, the, that she's not the movement, that it's actually the only reason that she has any ability to challenge the status quo here and get anything done is because she has a lot of feet on the ground who do the phone calls and show up at the city council meetings and pack the chambers and are very vocal and very present so you know everyone knows that they're a political force in the city and that is how you get things done on the local level you literally have to have show up and these days what that means is that people have to call the phone lines during the city council meeting and agree to do some public comments and write uh, emails and leave messages with their city council members saying, this is what we support. And they need to be very, very organized in order to make that happen. And as far as I can tell, they are, Jeff. I mean, people are just adapting their political organizing to online skills. And in that way, some of the tech and geeky folks you know, that, that we rely on have become even more important because you know somebody has to run the, con- the multimedia conference. Somebody has to make sure that all the tech things are working. But it looks like it's okay. We're in a pretty tech-savvy city, so people have adapted pretty well. I'm sure there's a few people out there who don't have computers or just don't know how to interact, but really all you need is a telephone, and then you can call the city council and ask when the next meeting is and when the public comment period is, and you can register, and then 
what they do is they'll let you speak over your phone and then they feed that to all of the council members in their remote like, locations so that everybody hears you. So it's like yeah. a conference call, you know. Yeah, no, I think that, that I think that however you can do it, and again, if she can become mayor of Seattle, and then it opens it up to to other people, whether they are described as uh, democratic socialist or progressives or whatever, can run for mayor. And maybe some of them, you know, have the ability, you know, who are self-financed, you know, whether they're entertainers, musicians, uh, actors, whatever, that can, you know, don't have to go out there with cup in hand like the majority of members of Congress and others always looking for some uh, some campaign money. Maybe they can do it on their own. I think that's a way to grow it. And you know, start off as mayor, if you're successful enough, then you can run for, for governor. And that's where you find the next round of Democratic candidates for president, you know, not the Joe Bidens of the world that has been there for four. 40 years uh, off the trough of, of um, uh, major corporations from the corporate state of Delaware. So, I mean, I'm, I'm sick and tired of this uh, this uh, merry-go-round that we have. But, you know, you're you're more than just a political side. You uh, now are involved, besides the music piece, you're involved now in this um, old-time radio theater, Nick Savage. Uh, for a lot of our listeners who haven't had a chance to, to talk to you about all of this, give us a little background on what you're doing, because I know you've been, because of COVID, 19 you've had some time to go into the studio uh, and do these things yes well you know my grandfather charles jacobs uh, world war ii vet and and my father floyd Cantrell sort of turned me on to the old shadow with orson wells and some of those old detective theaters I, my dad was always making fun of the shadow saying who knows shadow who knows works in the hearts of men <laughs> so i remember growing up hearing him say that and i kept thinking what the heck is he talking about you know because i didn't know anything about radio shows back then everybody watched television all day long six hours a day or whatever so i started checking them out they're all available now at least the ones that that have been recovered uh that they actually recorded have been uh, posted on youtube and the internet archive um dot org so there's a lot of great stuff out there and i got really influenced i ended up writing a novel called nick savage private eye he's a private eye here in seattle circa 1947 so post-war and it's kind of the, the rough and tumble Seattle when the ex police chief of police was the largest bootlegger in town and things like that. <laughs> so it was a rough and tumble town. Um, but Nick is there to kind of, you know, save the day. And he's always up against all the typical genre characters, the gangsters and the corrupt cops and, and judges and politicians and things trying to do the right thing. Because he is actually also a World War II veteran. So when people ask him, well, what? aren't you kind of afraid to go up against this local mob boss or something or this local you know, political boss? He's like, ah, you think they're criminals? You should have saw the guys we were fighting in World War II. Remember Tojo or Hitler? Remember those guys? You want to talk about real criminals? Those are the people that you should worry about. It's like these local mob bosses, oh, no problem. I got it taken care of, you know. I mean, even at your Wajima and was stuck in a foxhole with his wounded buddy for five hours waiting for some kind of air support that wasn't there. So he knows tough times so the things that really bother people around him doesn't really bother him much but I based a lot of that character on the old Philip Marlowe series because she had these great private detective novel writers like Raymond Chandler Dashiell Hannett Mickey Spillane you know Mickey Spillane had Mike Hammer was his detective you had Raymond Chandler's Philip Marlowe Dashiell Hammett had his detectives and they all sort of had their own perspective city where they did their work out of well seattle never really had one so i decided to create one and so the radio plays based on that and some of the people i'm working with and the samples that i'm using and stuff are from are actually from the old vintage radio plays and so anyway, it's like that's the real soundtrack that they were using back in 1947 and so we mix in some of the old commercials um and then i sometimes use people who actually aren't actors but are just people who have really interesting voices and I, I was talking to Tom Lopez, who did one of my favorite radio series called the ZBS, not C as in Columbia Broadcasting System, but ZBS, um, out of Nyack, New York, or actually it's up in Port, Fort Edwards. And they did some really great modern stuff back in the 80s and 90s that used to be broadcast on national public radio in full-on, you know, 3D stereo, really well recorded and all, all sorts of really great stuff. And he did a similar thing where he would find someone who had a really unique voice, like, you know, um, Juliana is from Sao Paulo, Brazil. She has a beautiful Brazilian accent, right? So, man, I must use her in my play. So all I have to do is write a part for her. She doesn't really have to act, she just has to depart and be herself. And that's really nice. It's kind of the, the John Malshevik, uh 
style of acting or the John Wayne style of acting where you don't really act. You just kind of act like you always do. You know, right, exactly. Right. Hey, listen, before before yeah. we uh, roll here, I wanted to ask you, uh, because, uh, you know, we spent a lot of time uh, yesterday on the 50th anniversary of the Bobby Orr goal. That was a huge thing here in Boston, but uh, maybe it's the most amazing goal, the overtime winner to win the Stanley Cup for the Bruins. Where is the uh, status of the Seattle hockey team? Is it next year they're going to start the season, right? Yeah, it was supposed to start. Next year? Yeah. yeah. There's been so much that's happened since then. People are not really talking too much about sports right now in Seattle, as you can well imagine. Uh, if they are, it's because the athletes and the sports teams are part of our community and are acting as members of the community trying to help everybody stay safe. Is but the rebuilding that, of Key yeah, Arena uh, uh, being, is that still on target, or are they, are they taking time away from from uh, this as well? And, and are they going to you know supposedly get back? Is that one of the, the buildings that uh, Inslee is, is going to allow to be rebuilt? or? I'm sure they'll get back to it at some point, yes. I don't know what the details are of that yet. I do know that no construction has got, been happening in Seattle, and I am surrounded by billion-dollar real estate developments by Amazon and Google and other major corporations, and they all just stopped. I mean, you could hear a pin drop in Seattle for a month, and it was really kind of eerie seeing all these cranes and nobody's working those buildings. But that's now just starting to pick up again slowly. But this this uh, stay-at-home order, the, these rent restrictions and things, rent, eviction restrictions, are already statewide supposed to last until June 4th. So Seattle is under another month of stay-at-home, basically, at this point, unless something changes. And yeah. I don't know. I mean, I can tell, but I can tell people that Everyone is here is very creative, and everyone is finding ways of 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 uh, enjoying life and getting out. Finally, you know, I've seen that just within the last week or so. We're finally there's a few more boats out on the lake, and people are going out. They're not necessarily hanging out in big numbers and crowds anywhere, but they're actually like leaving their apartments on a sunny day on the weekend. During the week, it's still pretty quiet, and there's not much going on. And by the way, you know, if people want to check out what I do, and I should remember to tell them this. You can go to YouTube, basically, and see and listen to all of the Private Eye series. There's also a few of them up at SoundCloud, but YouTube is a way, really good way to do that. That's, that's a really fantastic. good portal. I think that's... some of the archives of this show that I do with you, Jeff. So if they want to hear our spots, they can go there. And, and again, what's that website? Uh, just go put my name, Mark Taylor Canfield, in uh, at YouTube in the search engine. It'll go right to my channel. There's only one Mark Taylor Canfield. That's right. In, there is on only YouTube. one Mark Taylor yeah. Canfield, and that's why he's here every Tuesday. Uh, Mark, thank you, my friend. Um, always keep on fighting, and uh, thank you for your great work, uh, and including the work you're doing on, on radio theater as well. It's, it's so unique. Thanks, but that's Jeff. why he's a Renaissance you rock. man. Thank you, you man. Have you a great too. Show. Uh, you keep on fighting. I want to thank you uh, for listening today. I want to thank Ron Kreider for producing this broadcast. Keep fighting. We're going to be back here tomorrow. Making a little bit of changes to the lineup. Some, some new people uh, you'll be hearing. Some old. And always new. It's the Jeff Santos Show. My name is Jeff Santos. Right now it's my time to say I got to go.